Dr. Whiting's doing a Coke de Leon dry fly line, basically. Hmm. Uh, he's he's uh, paired them with Euro, Euro style uh, long dry fly uh, saddle birds with Coke de Leon. So now you've got the sheen and bronzing of a Coke de Leon and speckling with coupled with the dry fly hackle. So you've got a super long, super sparkly thing uh, hmm. that you could potentially use, maybe not this year, but uh, I'd say in the next year or two. Mm -hmm. uh, dry fly hackle, that Coke de Leon, legit dry fly hackle. That was Curtis Fry talking about a new Coke de Leon dry fly product in the making at Whiting. Dry fly tying and much more from Fly Fish Food today. This is episode number 40 of the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. We'll help you on your fly fishing journey with classic stories covering steelhead fishing, fly tying, and much more. How's it going, everyone? Thanks for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show. Before I get into the intro, I want to remind you to leave a quick comment on the blog post for this episode at wetflyswing.com slash 40. This uh, lets me know you're uh, still out there and uh, keeps the conversation going. In today's episode, I interview Curtis Fry, co-founder of Fly Fish Food, one of the biggest online fly tying brands today. Curtis talks about their most productive dry flies. He talks about boating and fishing the Provo River and why producing fly tying videos from the first person view isn't always the best idea. We talk about what's new for fly fish food this year, the best dry flies to start with, the Fripple fly, and their infamous Lego fly video. Don't miss this as he talks about why we are in the golden age of fly tying right now and why we are seeing so many amazing fly tires out there. So, without further ado, here's Curtis Fry from flyfishfood.com. How's it going, Curtis? Hey, it's going well, thanks. Good, great to have you on here. Uh, I've uh, got a few questions here around uh, fly fishing and fly tying, and uh, you guys, I've been following you for a little while out there on, uh, you know, from Fly Fish Food. You, you guys have a bunch of real, really uh, great content and information I'm hoping Thanks. to dig. I'm hoping to dig into that a little bit. Um, maybe before we get into uh, how fly fish food came to me, maybe, maybe you can talk about how you got into fly fishing and, and tying. Yeah, so uh, most of that started when I was in high school. I had a uh, a buddy whose dad had some fly fishing equipment, and we would take it out every once in a while and buy a three pack of flies at Kmart or whatever store was we could and didn't know what we were doing at all um then i had a scout leader that his buddy tied flies and i thought that was really cool that he was making the flies that we take out we were just using a spinning rod and a bubble with a you know, little tippet coming off the end with a fly and uh but you know they were t his tied flies and i thought that was cool so i in high school started getting into tying i actually tied for a couple of years before I even got my own fly rod mm. and uh, I, it just uh, really fascinated me. So mm -hmm. that's how I got into it and then just ended up kind of going from there. Hmm. Yeah. I've talked to a number of people that are, <clears throat> I've kind of had every kind of the whole spectrum from people that, you know, I mean, there's people that just tie flies for sure out there and people that just fish. <laughs> it's kind of like whatever you're yeah, into, yeah. you know, whatever you're passionate about. What, um, so where did, now how did, uh, maybe you can describe how Fly Fish Food came to be, because this is a pretty big uh, brand out there online and everything. Maybe you can yeah. talk about how that came to be. Yeah. So kind of an interesting origin story. So I, I've known Cheech for, uh, we're partners in the little endeavor here. Um, I've known him for a lot of years, maybe 20, I don't hmm. know. Uh, and it's just one of those things where, um, you get to uh, you know, fish and do some outings together and what have you. And uh, over years, and we're tying flies and stuff, of course. And uh, we decided, hey, one of these days we did. Well, I'd been doing a, a a newspaper article for the Salt Lake Tribune every week called Fly of the Week, and mm. probably one of my biggest questions I'd get from the readers was where do I get these materials and so I'd feel a lot of those emails and, and Cheech and I were talking one time 
uh, you know, just kind of on the the aspect of there's a lot of that where you just you can't find one place to get materials and or at least you know get recipes listed of things that uh, for for our stuff that we had been doing and so he said oh, let's put together a, a blog and for our benefit as well where we could keep kind of an archive of our stuff and so we just started filming the tutorials uh posting the materials and still got those same questions like oh i can't find this material anywhere i can't find that so that just kind of morphed into just starting a little online store and uh, that just started to grow and grow as kind of a snowball effect uh we opened up a fly shop with uh the back side is a warehouse for online fulfillment and then the front end is a full retail brick and mortar shop. So that's oh, wow. uh, kind of the history of it. It really just snowballed into something a lot bigger than we, we would have thought, but <clears throat> we've kind of rolled with it. So <laughs> yeah, that's cool. So you guys are, and basically, so the online portion um, and the videos is is how you guys got started. But now it's um, you know now it's a full on. Um, you know, materials and products. And mm-hmm. do you guys have other fly fishing, just non-fly tying type products? Oh, yeah. We yeah. we carry uh, four different uh, lines of rods. Uh, we carry reels, oh, wow. fly lines, pretty much everything. We're, um, I, I would say, with, I, I, I wouldn't say we're a standard fly shop because if you go in, you will not find a fly shop that has more fly tying selection than we do. But um, we don't carry a lot of soft goods or boots and waders yet from a space standpoint. But we're uh, we're on the prowl for a different space. It's going to be a lot bigger. So Yeah. That's yeah. where we are now. That's cool. That's cool. And uh, so that question, yeah, I get that question quite a bit too on finding materials. How, how do you answer that as, as far as when, you know, people online, where to find materials? So our goal from the beginning, well, very very early in the beginning, not maybe day one, but very quickly we realized that um, it was difficult to go anywhere, even like a, an online big box like a Cabela's or or whatever, and have all the materials that you'd want, even special, you know, specialty flies and that sort of thing. So we really at- approached it from that standpoint of, hey, if we build this, let's make sure that we have everything that anybody could want to tie, you know, 80%, 90% of the patterns that are out there. So that's really what we did. We worked with uh, Hairline uh, a lot with Nature Spirit. Mm -hmm. Um, We also work with Wapsi. And when I say work with, uh, you know, we we do work with them to bring new products as well as bring back old products. So if we know, for instance, with Wapsi, there's uh, been a couple products that, we said, hey, you know, you, you guys had these. Now you don't. Why? Well, hmm. they say, well, they don't sell. And so we'll say, hey, we can fix that. All right. And uh, so we do work with them in the hairline specifically. We're doing um, a branded line of different materials and things that uh, we started last year with some stonefly chenille, uh, rolling out a couple new products in the next few months as well with them. Um, and Nature Spirit we've worked with uh, to – kind of flesh out different uh, colors of products, kind of cemented certain products into, you know, the the mainstream stuff that may not have been there before. Um, so, which is a challenge too, because there's a lot of times if we have a tutorial that hits just right and people like it and they end up buying all the materials, we've been known to sell out huh. uh, the manufacturers, not just our supply, but, you know, you, you go to Hairline today, you'll find a number of products in our tutorials that are just gone. You can't yeah. get anywhere. So uh, we try to plan in advance for some of those things when we can. Huh. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's pretty cool. Yeah, you guys are – yeah, definitely it's obvious out there on – at least online that you guys are one of the big big players out there. I mean, what is uh, – and I was just thinking, you know, your partner Cheech, he seems to be the, <laughs> I'm not sure if he's the, the crazy uh, partner or whatever, but uh, <laughs> what is, I mean, the, do you have a story about uh, your guys' uh, kind of the whole thing since you guys have been together or? Yeah, that's, you, uh, it, it, he it, is the crazy okay. one, just, yeah. just uh, for reference. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no. um, I'd say uh, 
creative mind, uh, crazy mind go hand in hand. But yeah. He, he's, he's a good guy. Uh, we've been, we, you know, we've had a good working relationship. Um, kind of started, I met him years ago at a, there was a little fly tying event at a local shop here in Utah. Um, and I had taught a class earlier the, in the evening and Cheech had come for a kind of a special demo. And so my class had finished up and I'm sitting here watching this guy and he, I think he said he'd been tying for a year or two, not much, you know, and I've, I, I'd been tying for at least 10 or 15, you know, maybe yeah. more. I can't remember. And, you know, I was like, wow, this dude's clean. He's got, he's got some really tight looking flies. Huh. Um, and, uh, met him. We ended up going on a couple of fishing trips and would fish together and that sort of thing. But one thing it made me do was, uh, reevaluate the quality of the, the flies that I've been tying. I'm like, man, I've, hmm. I'm kind of lazy. I just, uh, was mm-hmm. letting stuff slide that I, you know, I look back and I'm like, yeah, that's not a very good fly. I know maybe a fish would eat it, of course, but right. I, you know, if, if, if we're not worried about if we're, if it's an ugly fly thing, I just throw corn, right. You know, there's sure. fly tying for me, at least there's, there's some satisfaction in the, in the quality and, and, uh, the art of it. So anyway, that's, that's kind of how it all started. It was a fly tying event. And then we've okay. been tying and fishing, you know, ever since. So, yeah. Yeah. What do you think is the, if you had to say one big thing, uh, you've learned from che- uh, Cheech over the years, what, what, what would that be? Oh boy. Um, Ed, you know, I think it's that as far as fly tying goes, it's just the, that one thing of just pay attention to what you're doing. Yeah. And, and there's no, you know, probably one of the more common things we hear is, oh, those flies are meant to catch fishermen. <laughs> and, uh, which, yeah, of course that's true. But again, I'll go back to the analogy of, well, if, if we're just going to throw fur on a hook, just throw corn or, or power bait or something. Yep. So, you know, it's that mixture of creativity and, uh, the quality of what goes into your work. Um, and that's kind of been the thing that w- at least I got from Cheech and, and have carried on to guide what I do too. So, yeah, no, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that's a, a good uh, a good uh, point to make there. And um, so, uh, yeah, I was going to go into a little bit on uh, dry flies uh, before we fully get there. Maybe you can talk about. You said uh, you're in uh, Utah. Is do you do you have a home river that uh, you fish, and do you, do you fish dr- uh, dries quite a bit there? Yeah, so uh, we do a lot of fishing on the Provo River, which is well, probably as a crow flies about four miles from our shop really really close um and our absolutely our favorite time of year to fish is mostly during the summer where you'll see dry flies become the the uh main well it's the main thing we fish most of the guides and people that are fishing the river are still going to be doing nymphs but okay. uh for us probably the number one pattern on the river would be lance egan's bionic ant okay or a Palomino caddis, which is both our tutorials on our website, but um, it, it's just a blast. We, we float it in a little fly craft, uh, fly fishing raft kind hmm. of thing. Uh, it's not a huge river, so it's, uh, you know, you're, it's a pretty leisurely float. You have to drop through a couple of uh, train trestles, but other than that, it's, it's pretty tame. Huh. Uh, but dry fly fishing is phenomenal. So. Wow, what's the uh, dropping through train trestle? What, what's that all about? Well, you got uh, the river flowing along, and then there's a train trestle going across, so it has two to three pylons that you have to navigate. Um, they're skinny, yeah. so which is oh, one yeah. of the reasons why the fly craft works well because it's a, a relatively narrow oh, raft. So, so gotcha. So you wouldn't take a yeah, we, you wouldn't take a, a drift boat through there. No, no, you wouldn't. Uh, you you could you maybe one of our friends does a smaller hide uh like the pram style i can't remember what the name of that drifter is but it's smaller and i think he goes through the one of the trestles okay mm, he, it'd be kind of tight but you, you'd make it 
Yep. So, yeah. <laughs> Bang your way through. Uh, yeah. Cool. So, yeah, I was thinking on the uh, topic of dry flies. I just had a question from... Oh, somebody here on uh, on the Facebook group, and they were talking about uh, the, one of the biggest struggles for fly tying is wrapping hackle. Do you, um, you mm, do yeah. you have a, a tip for you know for dry flies and wrapping hackle, or you know for that question? Yeah, so probably uh, depends on the style of hackle. If you're just doing kind of the traditional wrapping around the hook um, technique, or if you were going to be doing a parachute. Uh, the probably the biggest thing is how you start your hackle. So you tend to want to strip off a few fibers, you know, six or seven, whatever, uh, at at the stem where you're going to tie it in. And what that does is number one, it allows you to seat the hackle how you want. So you you want to tie that in with a a wrap or two, and then begin the wrap. Some feathers you'll notice will twist a little bit as you begin that first wrap. So Mm-hmm. If you notice it twisting into a way that when you continue the wrap, it's going to be all ski wampus, yep. you can back that off, adjust the angle, retie it, and then do it. So those the stripped fibers also help to get you uh, a clean uh, wrapping point so that as you wrap that, your first couple of maybe even your first full wrap or maybe half doesn't include any fibers to get bound down. So it lays down a kind of sets the path for the hackle to take so that's a that's a i mm-hmm. think the number one thing is to start your wraps correctly um, if you really want to be uh, meticulous and clean about it then you strip one half of the hackle that would be the inside the one you're going to place against the hook or the thread whatever you're mm-hmm. dubbing whatever you're tying against. um that way, there are no trapped fibers underneath. Because if you think about it, the one side of the hackles almost they're getting bound down by the the wraps there. So mm-hmm. that just helps to to clean that up. It basically cuts your efficiency down by half, but yeah, it does look super clean. It does. Okay. Anyway, yeah. nice, nice. And um, as far as your uh, your videos and just you know everything you guys have going online, I mean, I think you guys have a Really clean and lots of uh, really nice videos. Could you, how would you explain what you guys do as far as your videos and how you're different from a lot of the other people doing vid- uh, tying videos and things? And you don't only do tying videos. You, you you have some other stuff, right? Yeah, we do. We do a lot of different stuff. Um, we we kind of actually started the YouTube channel years and years ago, just dinking around on some fishing trips and filming it and putting it on there. Uh, then I, when I started doing the Salt Lake Tribune articles, I would also film a video in association to the article that would come out in the paper um then when we started the blog we said all right you know how what's which direction we're going to take this and so with respect to the fly tying stuff specifically and again answering that question of where do i get all this stuff so we try to embed uh, at least uh, every video has a blog post associated with it and and with that is a material list with even a button that adds every of item on that recipe to your cart hmm. and so they can literally add all to cart check out boom you've got all the materials to tie that fly it's kind of a kit that's cool. if you will uh or they can choose all of them except one or one however that works but so I, i'd say that kind of differentiates it in the sense that we're uh making it a lot easier for people that always have yeah. that question of where you get that stuff um the other part of that too is uh we tend to, probably more than a lot of the other channels you'll see out there, uh, we tend to go a little nuts on tweaks or quote-unquote new patterns and mm-hmm. variations. Uh, we do a lot of, we call it R&D if you want, you know, where you can say, hey, you know, it's a cool pattern, a different style, let's try this out and get it out on the water and see how it does. Uh, a lot of our patterns too. We've, for instance, we we fished a pattern a couple nights ago that hadn't even seen the end of one of our lines. Mm-hmm. Friends of ours had used it for a year and a half, and we hadn't had a, an opportunity to use it. It's a mouse pattern, and uh, but you know we had already gotten a lot of feedback. They'd been to Mongolia, they'd been to Alaska, and uh, so you know then we fish it and end up uh, kind of confirming what we already knew but 
so we're we're a little bit more creative, I guess. Mm-hmm. More creative. We we try to be creative in our in our approach, and uh, so that's that's probably the biggest differentiator there. Yeah, you see a lot of weird stuff out there we throw out there. Nice, <laughs> nice. So yeah, you probably get a little bit of feedback. I mean, on some of that, and as far as who your flies are for, I mean, obviously you guys are fishing there. Are you? I mean, you're hitting people from all around the country, the world. I mean, and mm-hmm. how do you balance that with different? you know, the different bugs and hatches and things like that come off in different areas. Yeah. So that's an excellent question. Uh, probably that is the most difficult of what we do because uh, we get almost daily requests for different types of patterns. And um, we get a lot of requests for saltwater and we're obviously yeah. in the middle of the desert. There's no, <laughs> well, there is saltwater right, right oh, up yeah. the road. There's that's no, right. No it. Yeah. Um, but so what we've done in those types of situations, when we get requests for things that we're unfamiliar with, we go off, off of, you know, if it's a bait fish, you get a picture of the bait fish, that's not rocket science to figure that out. And, mm-hmm. and we'll often send out patterns. We, we have acquaintances and, and buddies in pretty much every corner of the world that we could, you know, at some point say, Hey, give this a try. Mm-hmm. Um, so the, the patterns we tie at least that, do see a lot of of FaceTime, if you yeah. will, even before we're able to throw them. So even right. in areas that are not you know, associated with something where we may actually be fishing, we can still uh, curtail that. Uh, the other thing, too, if we're sitting out there and we get a couple requests from, say, Pennsylvania or somebody that's a, a spring creek catch mm-hmm. of, of whatever, um, then we can throw a tutorial on there for a, even a variation of a pattern that we've done before that may be changing the size color and maybe the style a little bit so but yeah that really drives it is just kind of hatches matching those hatches uh finding how they're doing but we we do have a lot of feet on the street uh you will know, we'll get people there's sometimes there are negative nellies out there will comment well no, how do you even know this works you know, yep. you're just throwing stuff up there <laughs> haven't even tried it and and sure, sometimes we'll post a picture of a fly that's never seen the water. But a lot of the stuff we do also behind the scenes has got a lot of uh, uh, traction even before we post a photo because we are we try to be a little bit more uh, uh, strategic on our approach for things like that. So Yeah. Yeah, I was just thinking, as you, just before you said that, I was thinking of a episode way back in episode number three of our podcast. Jay Nicholas was talking about steelhead flies and... You know, he ties a lot of steelhead and salmon flies, and he had the same thing. People called him out on a fly because he just tries new stuff and same thing. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, you know, you've never used that. And, and Jay was like, well, yeah, actually, I, at the time, he, he mentioned that he hadn't really used it that much, you know. And mm-hmm. But the point is, is that, I mean, you do want to try new stuff, and that's how you find out, you know, new, new patterns that work. And um, I don't know, it just seems like not everything is going to work, but you might as well give it a shot. And you also hear some of these, I mean, nowadays, I... The question about these different flies, like, um, you know, all the, the UV and flies without legs and these things are just totally, you know, different colors, pinks. Maybe you can yeah. clarify a little bit on that um, now for somebody who has really been more traditional tying and, and all this new stuff. Yeah. So that, that brings up, I mean, kind of the tip of the iceberg, what you're mentioning, but that, that goes into uh, what we call the golden age of fly tying, where today you can get... I mean, specifically with dry flies, you cannot find better dry fly hackle today hmm. than you, you know, in, in any point in history. And that's 99.9% due to Tom Whiting uh, and his genetic wizardry over at Whiting Farms. Hmm. Um, the quality of the hackle, but the quantity and actually the price you pay is affordable and, and there's a lot of different options. So that's that's a big thing is the hackle. So for dry flies... There's yep. no better time to tie dry flies. Um, now that's still traditional, but you also start to look at things like he's Dr. Whiting's doing a Coque de Leon dry fly line. Basically, hmm. uh, he's he's uh, paired them with Euro Euro style uh, long dry fly uh, saddle birds with Coque de Leon. So now you've got the sheen and bronzing of a Coque de Leon and speckling with coupled with the dry fly hackle. So you've got a super long, super sparkly thing uh, that you could potentially use, maybe not this year, but uh, I'd say in the next year or two, 
mm-hmm. uh, dry fly hackle, a cocktail and a legit dry fly hackle. So, um, so that's one side of it. The other side is just the availability of of materials, both in colors and different kind of applications that you would have seen. Like you mentioned, UV. Um, I have a pattern, the fripple. It's a different. It's a mayfly cripple dry fly emerger kind of combo pattern, but I use uh, UV resin on the body so that, uh, and it's tied on a clean commerce style hook so that that sinks down into the surface film. Uh, you know, 10 years ago, you probably wouldn't have been able to do that exact style without a lot more trouble, maybe epoxy or whatever. But, um, and then colors too. You know, one of our most effective hopper colors is pink. Hmm. Uh, and again, who would have thought? Yeah. Uh, Reds do well. Purple is a huge color in fly tying. Mayflies, or almost every mayfly you can imagine, people are tying them in purple. That's cool. So, yeah. And why do you yeah. think, uh, I just had, um, oh, Rick Hafley on in episode 37, and he's one of the, you know, our kind of local entomologists out here. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I asked him kind of a similar question. And I think he mentioned that he, Roy, is more of a traditional tire. You know, he's kind of old school and didn't have yeah. a good answer of, you know, I guess, well, maybe I can't remember exactly what his answer was there, but as far as why those work, I mean, why, why do you think the purples and pinks and reds, it, I guess it's the kind of the hot spot thing, but do you have any explanation why those are so hot? <laughs> ah, who knows? But I, and I've got some thoughts. Uh, years ago, I read a book and I don't even know what it was, but it was, uh, it, probably when I was in high school. So it was an older school book, but it talked about colors. And one of the things it talked about was different times of the day and how colors look with the with the sun at different mm-hmm. levels, you know, mm-hmm. sunset or sunrise or noon. Uh, but it also talked about the ambient color. So if you're fishing, in, for instance, down the road, we've got a, a river that flows through some red rock. And uh, so a lot of orangey hues. So for us there, I've done well on oranges and pinks. And I don't know if that's because of that color where, it, you know, there's a little bit more of a hue of a, a certain color na- naturally, and it may drive them to that. Um, I've, you know, so it, there's that, you know, so there yeah. maybe is a, there could be a natural inducer there. Um, and I also think it's just the whole concept of a hot spot where it's a color, it stands out, however that color is reflected to the fish. Uh, maybe it makes them mad, I don't know. Yeah. Um, I'll say, though, I've had... Like one time in particular, I, I was fishing a lake. We're just on shore, kind of messing around. Uh, lots of hoppers around, so we ended up throwing some hoppers. And with uh, no luck, you know, we're throwing traditional colors. So I had this, I think, I'm pretty sure it was pink. might have been red, reddish pink, but it was not a standard hopper color. And I had read some articles that, of some guys doing well with these colors up in Montana. I said, well, better try. First cast, boom, fish Mm -hmm. on. And I'm fishing next to two other guys, fishing hoppers, ants, kind of terrestrial thing. And I'm sitting there catching them one after another on this pink Mm -hmm. hopper pattern. And and you go, there are no pink hoppers around here, so what the heck? And uh, so, yeah, it's just one of those weird things. Like, you you don't know, but... Yeah, uh, that's, yeah... I think, yeah, that's probably, yeah, it's just changing it up a little bit. And like anything, you know, you, sometimes those fish, especially for trout, when they've seen a lot of flies and things like that, maybe, mm-hmm. maybe that's part of it. Uh, yeah. You mentioned earlier, well, you mentioned the Whiting Farms and I think you had a video online where you toured the Whiting Farms facility. Was that, was that Whiting? Yes. Yeah. So, um, we have a great relationship with Whiting Farms. Um, we work with them on different product. I don't want to call them launches cause they, had these chicken lines around, but maybe different focus product focus is a better word for it. Um, so we've gone out there a few times. Uh, this last time we went, made a, a, a concerted effort to do some different videos. Uh, we've still actually got one in the hopper on Coke de Leon. And, uh, so, and Tom Whiting's uh, just awesome when it comes to that sort of thing. He's, mm-hmm. he's a very forward thinker, uh, understands the, value of social media and getting some education out there is what uh, the, the end goal is because, uh, yep. you know, he's got nothing to gain 
you know, nobody's going to be able to come in and, oh, look how he does that. I'm going to go compete with him. I mean, he's, <laughs> yeah, he's, he's a, yeah, he's, he's a doc. He's got a doctorate in pul- poultry husbandry. Oh, so, wow. Uh, and he's doing this long enough. Huh. Uh, so, but yeah, probably one of the funnest non-fishing trips we've done. Uh, the team there is phenomenal. Just, it's just a great experience. And the, the amount of work that goes into these dry fly hackles, well, not just dry fly hackles, but you got all the oh, yeah. uh, wet flies, you know, hens and uh, all these different Coq de Leon products and variations that are coming out now. Huh. And marabou, chicken marabou, chicken right. uh, schloppen. So, yeah, that's yeah. awesome stuff. Yeah, lots of, lots of good stuff there. The, uh, yeah, I was just going to note, we've made a note of a couple of links and things I'll have at uh, wetflyswing.com slash 40. Um, I'll have all the show notes with links to some of the stuff we're talking about here. And uh, yeah, so on the dry fly uh, topic, we're talking about material. As far as like if somebody kind of really, you know, <laughs> sucks at fly, uh, tying dries and they want to get better, obviously they can go watch, yeah. you know, your videos and things like that. But as far yep. as choosing hackles, you said it's, you know, hackles are really good. What would you recommend somebody that's just getting going? They want to get, they want to get better at tying dry flies. They know having a good hackle is, is better. At wet. What would sure. you tell them? Yeah. So that's absolutely the most common question we get. Um, what I usually recommend is first base the color of the hackle and the style off of what you'll be tying. So if you're, if you're in Colorado and you're going to be tying for your local stream and there's a lot of betas or bluing dollops, then you may look at, uh, you know, like a medium or light done. And based on the size, uh, if you're tying 18s and 20s, then you probably want to look at a cape is the capes are overall going to have smaller hackle sizes. Mm-hmm. You can get midge-sized saddles now, which is oh, wow. insane. <laughs> so that would be good, especially for numbers. Uh, so we usually say start off with, again, something to match what you're going to tie. If you're not sure, then the three main colors that we recommend are your grizzly brown and, and done. Yep. And to save money, you could do half capes or half saddles, those. Uh, mm-hmm. buy in those you could also buy a saddle with somebody and split it um, but whiting does give the breakdowns and as far as you know, different quantities of hackle that you buy so that's really nice um, but yeah that's that's the the good okay. way to approach it uh, another way you can do is 100 packs those are oh, yeah. sized those are pre-sized so yeah, and and as far as the different um, quality of hackles, are they? I and mean, there's still different qualities, yeah. and that's just the, on the amount yeah. of flies you can tie per hackle. Correct. Yeah. So, and that's a probably the biggest misconception in the grading system. Uh, so, Whiting calls it the Olympic grading system, which includes bronze, silver, gold, platinum. Uh, at the bottom of that, which isn't technically part of the grading system, is pro, and any of those grades the quality is the same these are the same genetics the same everything the only difference being this chicken had more feathers or they were denser or in the case of some of the pro grades what you'll find is the same density the same feather count but some of the tips were broken off so during the chicken's life they maybe had some tips which kind of don't matter because you're not tying explicitly with the tips so uh, when all said and done, you can get really good quality across any of the grades. It's simply a matter of the quantity that you'll get. So you could hold up a silver, open it up, a uh, saddle, for instance, and then kind of look at the density of the feathers, pull out a pro density of feathers. You'll notice you'll get less. There's less f- fibers. You'll also find likely that you'll you get some bigger sizes. So they're kind of fine-tuning for quantity. And size is part of that, uh, the actual hackle size as, as well as hackle density. So. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yep. So as I was kind of uh, watching some of your videos, I think one of the, I don't know if it was one of the most popular ones, but the uh, the Lego fly, do you remember that yeah. that video? Maybe, oh, yeah. you, maybe you could talk old, about, yeah, that, it's old school. Yeah. It's one of the first ones. What, what <laughs> was that all about? Because it was pretty fun to watch that thing. Was that uh, how you produced that and all everything? Yeah. <laughs> so it was... Uh, I don't remember exactly what it was that I saw, uh, or it might have been my son. He was into Legos. That's where the, the little characters came from, oh, yeah. Lego set. But uh, I saw stop motion of 
Lego something, and I thought it'd be a fun thing to do with my son. So we set up a little studio there and got some software to do stop motion. And it took us, I think, maybe four or five hours. Uh We just sat down, and he helped film it, and we put it all together. And I didn't, you know, this is kind of dumb, whatever, and it just went nuts. So, yeah, up until recently, it was our top. Yeah, video, and that's years ago. So. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, I'll I'll put a link in the show notes for that. See, so uh, the good. I was. Yeah, it seems like some of that stuff with the, with the kids stuff for some reason. Oh, I guess it's just funny. You know, you want to be. Yeah. You want to yeah, be different. It's different. And, yeah, it hits home. I we have a coffee table book that's like a. Um, Oh, I'll have to, I'll put a link in the show notes. So it's basically a, I think it was a couple that, um, it, it seemed like maybe they got, <laughs> they got really high or something. They grabbed a bunch <laughs> of, uh, dinosaur, uh, like a kid's dinosaur figures, you know, and basically uh-huh. did the same. Well, they just took photos of them, like destroying their house and like with little one liners next to it. It was just, just hilarious. So it's kind of the same sort of thing. And I get a kick out of that every time I see it. So, I mean, with your guys' videos, how do you guys keep them? you know, like that. I mean, they haven't keep them fun and enjoyable. What, what's the secret there to get, you know, get so many views? Yeah. I think with anything that you do, uh, even if it's to quote unquote boring, uh, tying video, we try to inject a little bit of humor into it and not, not be so dry. So you have to be intentional. I mean, that's yeah. the kind of thing you have to be thinking of what you're going to do and, and not, you know, if, if something comes up, like if Cheech farts in the middle, yeah, you, you let it roll. You know, <laughs> I mean, you keep that. But yeah, uh, yeah just to just to be kind of different and not to be boring. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, that was. Uh, I've heard that one before. As far as I think it was Seth Godin that said, "Yeah, just <laughs> don't be boring. That's the number one thing." Which yeah. uh, <laughs> cool. So yeah, well, I've got. Um, I've got some more fly tying questions here around, um, you know, dry flies. I definitely want to dig into before I get there. I was hoping you could tell us a little more about, you know, fly fish food and maybe, you know, what, what's your, you know, if you have, you guys have a goal for like where you're going, I mean, you're obviously pretty big now, but what, at, you know, at the end of the day, where, where do you guys want to see this thing? Um, yeah, we, we want to keep growing. This is the, something that we like, which is good for, uh, the fact that you can have a business that is a passion. Mm-hmm. So win-win there, right? Mm-hmm. Um, we've got a lot of goals uh, to to pursue as far as what we want to do with fly fish food, improvements. We meet, uh, you know, and, and chat about plans and execution quite often. So we're, we're always formulating what's next, how are we going to improve, uh, Probably the biggest thing in the in the near future, or hopefully near, is a much bigger space. Hmm. So we're going to be moving into uh, a, a lot bigger space. We've got uh, an insane amount of fly tying material jammed into a fairly small space. Uh, we want to spread that out and get, give the feathers room to breathe, hmm. yeah. <laughs> uh, and give people t- you know ability to move around a little bit more, um, expand our non tying offerings too so mm-hmm. it uh, the ultimate goal there would be to have a, a large full service kind of have everything fly shop yeah. um, so just expanding on what we have basically okay and you guys uh you're not really into the, the guiding end of things and all that with the shop we do we subcontract everything uh we don't guide ourselves usually it's just not enough time in the day but uh we we, we do actually have uh good selection of seasoned guides that we draw from. So uh, mostly here on the Provo, but we also subcontract to a couple spots in Wyoming and some in Southern Utah. So we're, we do, if somebody comes on board and, and they say, Hey, I want to fish wherever you fished. And we've got a guide that will go there. We can get people pointed in the right direction. Okay. Okay, cool. Yeah. yeah so you guys kind of cover, cover it all there. What's the, um, you know, we were talking a little about earlier on this as far as, you know, flies that you tie, but is there a, um, you know, when you choose your next videos to, to do, how do, how do you guys, you know, make those choices on what you're going to tie? That's just kind of come from what you're fishing with and what's hot over there? Yep, that's that's pretty much the main driver. Um, uh, you know, you kind of touched on it before based on the hatches, but, uh, you know, like this time of year we're fishing terrestrials, 
uh, drakes. We did a couple of drake videos. Um, but terrestrials, we'll, we have an ant, a new ant pattern that we're going to release probably this week. Hmm. Um, and how many and how so, many videos do you guys typically try to release per week or per month? We try to do two per week is, is uh, the frequency that we've been trying to do for the last year or so. Mm-hmm. This time of year, it's tough because there's a lot of stuff going on, but um, at least fishing-wise, because we also need to get out and field test some things and at the same time film a video. So or yeah. we do in the in the winter where it's tying season is probably the best way to say we do build up a, a library of videos and just try to release them every about every Wednesday and okay. Sunday. So you have yeah. a bunch that are kind of in the queue already, right? Yeah. And yep. what do you, what do you, I know on the flight time, there's definitely some big, uh, you know, some big, uh, YouTubers out there and not many of them do the, you know, as far as where the camera angle is, you know what I mean? Like, you know, mm-hmm. most of the angle is looking at the person. Um, but I guess, I think, is it tight lines or one of them has the angle where it's like, you're, you know, you're looking from their perspective. Yeah. What do you, uh, what do you have a take on, on that at all? Yeah, you know, at, at first that was probably more of a concern, and I we did a couple very early on that were first person, yep. and the uh, the main challenge there, without getting into nerdy details on camera lenses, and you know how close you can be to the fly mm-hmm. versus how much of a hindrance the camera would be sitting in front of you, um, we ended up noticing that. Uh, and this is kind of proven over time that people are used to looking at it from that other angle. Oh yeah. And so the, the third person or second person angle, uh-huh. um, to the point where we've taken informal polls and, and talked to people and just, you know, no, no, nothing scientific, but yeah. that, uh, people almost prefer it that way because of the fact that when they do watch somebody tie, that's how they're watching it. Oh, so yeah. it's not that big of a, huh. a jump to say, oh, okay, I see how they're doing that. Um, but yeah, that, that is a consideration. It's just uh, one of those things where we felt that, uh, given the trouble and the limitations, yep. we decided to keep it as is. Totally. It'd be easier today to do it than even five years ago because of camera technology, but, uh, yeah. we'll that, probably still stick to it. That's what I was wondering about mine. I, I haven't done a lot of videos, but I've done some out there and it's, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a lot easier to have that camera out of your way. And I, I just use a little, like an SLR, just a basic camera and, I, I couldn't even think. I wonder, you know, I'm not even sure what you would use if you had that camera in between you and, and your and your vice. I guess you'd have a specialized type of camera, but um, I, yeah, you'd, you if you had a shorter lens, you could do it. Um, I've uh, worked with oh, probably three different macro lenses over time, mm-hmm. and I found a couple that would work great. The biggest problem with that size is filming bigger flies. No. So streamers would oh, be right. virtually impossible. You couldn't get them in there. Yeah. So uh, because we do a lot of the bigger flies and bigger foam flies, to be consistent, we had to find one that worked. So we actually use a 100 millimeter lens, oh, wow. which is a long long lens in the macro world, mm-hmm. or relatively so, I guess. And so we're a fair distance away, but that gives us the capability to move in and out because we'll film five to ten vi- uh, videos at once. And mm-hmm. so if you're going from a size 22 to a two watt without having to tear a bunch of stuff down, we can, we have a camera mounted on a slider that goes in and out mm-hmm. and uh, it's a simple adjustment. So, yep. Nice. Nice. So back to the, the tips on uh, dry flies. We, we talked about uh, one or two there. Do you have any of like the big tips you'd recommend for somebody who wants to, you know, get better at tying dries? Um, yeah, with dry flies, I think probably the number one, regardless of whether you're using hackle, number one thing that I would look at is proportions. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, and that really applies to any fly. But you look at uh, when we teach beginning classes or have people that are just getting started, that's probably one of the biggest uh, challenges is getting the proportions right. So when you're dealing with uh, dry flies specifically, I think it be, it's a little bit more obvious when the proportions are off. So I, I definitely look at proportions. Material selection, you know, if you're if you're going with a standard pattern, then that's probably taken care of. But if you're going to tweak some things, you know, obviously things like don't put a bead on it or <laughs> whatever, but there's 
lot of things too. You know, people are using materials that may soak water up. Right. Or uh, one of the things that I see, like with caddis patterns, is that they won't take the under fur out of the deer hair or elk mm-hmm. hair. Mm-hmm. And so now you've got um, yep. clumpy fur that's pulling stuff down. <laughs> that uh, uh, anyway, it's a it's a challenge there. So uh, there's just a lot of things like that. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, and you guys tie when you're doing your videos. Do you typically stick with a certain size pattern, or do you, do you tie some of the really small stuff on there too? Uh, we're all over the board. Yeah. I mean, we. Uh, to Cheech's credit, he has tied a proportional Adams parachute Adams on a size thirty. Oh wow! So and yeah, that's on, and uh, there's fact, a video for that. Well, <laughs> we are planning on doing a video going from thirty to ten. <laughs> yeah, nice. Just that's, to kind of show the range of what's out there, but uh, that's awesome. Yeah, so there's <laughs> size range. We're all over the board. I mean, yeah. We, We've titled uh, the the Morris Mouse that we released the other day uh, was on a you know, it's a pretty big dry fly um, mm-hmm. foam pattern hoppers you know those are in your fours to tens range and then locally we have a lot of midges and blowing doll of betas kind of things that are getting us down into the midges twenty fours twenty sixes thirties honestly we don't fish thirties that much but there's been times where you do need something small. So all over the board. Yeah. 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 I was just thinking as you're talking about the 30 down to 10, that is one of the tips I think I've recommended is, you know, if you do want to tie that size 24 or something, it, it's a good idea to maybe start with a little bigger of the same pattern yes. and then work your way down, yeah. down to it. Absolutely. I can't remember where I heard that one, but that was a good, I've got, actually, I think, um, I think Kelly Gallup is going to be on right next week, I believe. So um, he, oh, cool. he's got a bunch of good tips as well. And there, yeah, there's a good mix of people out there, you know, some of the, well, I guess you guys are kind of becoming kind of the old, old school brand now. Do you, do you consider yourself <laughs> that? Or are you still one of the, the new, the newbies out there up and covered? Oh man, I don't even, I don't even know. We, <laughs> we, uh, we just do this. We have a lot of fun. Um, the nice thing about having the, you know, the amount of exposure we do out in YouTube land and Instagram and Facebook and all that, but you know, so we, we do meet a lot of cool people. Uh, uh, we were traveling to shows, and every seems like every time we're in the airport, we'll have somebody who recognizes the hat. Oh, hey, yeah. fly fish, shoe guy. Oh yeah, there you uh, go. <laughs> so it's fun. You know, we it's, that's probably one of the, the biggest highlights is just the cool people you meet and the, and those associations. Uh, yeah. So how yeah. hard how hard has it been? One of the themes that comes up i've talked to everybody from you know you name it guides and shop owners everybody now with 30 episodes in Mm -hmm. you know as far as you guys to make i mean a theme that i hear a lot is like don't get into fly fishing for the money because it's small (laughs) and i mean how hard has it been for you guys to make and i'm not even sure if this is a full you know your full-time thing but um has it been pretty challenging to get to get to this point um you know i wouldn't say it's not been challenging there's definitely challenges and and it, it wouldn't be the expectation shouldn't be, hey, I'm just going to open a fly shop or an online shop, and I've got it made overnight. I mean, we've got we've got a a good formula here. My background, and so to answer your other question, we not, neither teach nor I do this full time. Mm-hmm. We we hire good guys that help us run it full time, um, and we do spend a lot of hours in the evenings and weekends to to get things mm-hmm. rolling. But, um, yeah, at the end of the day, uh, my background is, uh, inventory logistics and accounting software. So oh, wow. the inventory and business running side of the thing is pretty much what I do for a living. So mm-hmm. that, that fits nicely. Yeah, <laughs> it does. What we do. So, um, because really selling thousands and thousands of SKUs and different things in salt, small, yeah, sizes small. in large quantities is one of the more difficult things as far as the logistics oh, right. uh, and your mar- challenge goes. Margins yeah. are probably not super huge on that stuff. Yeah, and you you have, you know, spools of thread. You got to make sure you've got, if you say you have five on the website, you better have five in your, oh, wow. in your inventory. Yeah. So, um, it doesn't take too many, hey, I bought this and it's really not there kind of things to, to hurt your business. So that's been a challenge, but I've, feel that we've got a good system in place to do that. Uh, mm-hmm. 
So, you know, there's a, a whole lot of other things, but, you know, I, I definitely would say our goal is not and has not been, hey, we're going to get rich off of this. It's, yep. You know, day one, it was, at least when we started the store, it was like, hey, look, this is a good way to, to kind of help defray the cost of our hobby. Mm-hmm. And uh, and that's kind of been the approach all along. We're not taking a salary out to pay a mortgage. Takes away from materials we can buy. Takes away from uh, the different things that we may want to ch- invest in from a standpoint of giving stuff to our customers to you know new things. So mm-hmm. that's that's really the focus right now. Is just running this as uh, it's obviously you have to run it as a business or it's not going to work, but. Uh, it's still a hobby, focus, fun, kind of passion thing. Sure. Sure. That's cool. That's cool. Do you have a, um, a story about, uh, you know, fly fishing or fly tying or something from your life that, that, uh, kind of sticks out as, you know, maybe something that helped you, you know, get to where you are or go kind of all in on this thing? Um, you know, I think the thing that really got me into fly tying, I guess would be the biggest because it was the genesis point of it all but i uh, had been tying flies for just a little bit of time in high school my dad was going to take me up to this high mountain lake and uh, i wanted to tie some flies and i was going to throw on my little spinning rod there and uh, didn't really know what to tie you know that's probably the issue with most beginning guys what do I do? How's this going to work? And I had been reading a book that I had checked out from the local library that talked about high mountain lakes and ants so and mosquitoes. So I used some of my mom's black yarn from her yarn kit or whatever. <laughs> yep. um, tied uh, some of that on a hook. And I think I had some hackle from, must have been the nastiest hackle ever, from uh, my kit. And I went up there and I get up there and there's these two dudes in a canoe that were saying the fishing was horrible. And so I was not too positive about what the outcome would be. And then we get over there and uh, I start throwing this thing out and just catching fish hand, hand over fist. Hmm. I mean, it was one after another. Nice. I end up kept keeping a couple of them and gutted them that afternoon. And sure enough, full of ants. Huh. So that, that to me was like the, that cemented this is the coolest thing ever, you know, cause you're yeah. literally tricking that fish like that. But, and that's kind of been the guiding principle as we've started this. It's just a, it's a passion. We want to do this to have fun and, and it, but it's driven with that passion of, you know, what fly fishing is all about. It's just a, tricking the fish into taking something that they may normally eat. Mm-hmm. Maybe, maybe it makes them mad. Who knows? But it's, it's just that whole challenge of putting the whole, uh, different puzzle pieces together and solving it. Yeah, exactly. That yeah, keeps it. It definitely keeps it interesting. What do you think on the dry fly end are your maybe your best selling uh, fly patterns, or w- what would be something for you know some newbie if they had to pick six flies to to start out with? Which ones would you would you say? Um, I'd say definitely to cover the gamut of mayflies, you'd want to learn to tie a parachute atoms really well. That's probably one of the more effective mayfly imitating patterns. Um, compare duns be another one in the mayfly category and you vary those sizes and colors to match what you need so that's the beauty of that mm-hmm. um, I also think it's huge to be able to tie midges even though they're really small uh, mm-hmm. things like a, a griffith snad or or uh, little realistic looking uh, midges but I, I probably wouldn't start with midges because especially smaller ones but you could tie like yeah big size 14 griffith snat something to get some traction we do uh, one of the tutorials we have is called an orange asher probably one of the more effective pitch patterns we've thrown mm-hmm. in it's a size 14 it probably yeah. passes the mitch, mitch cluster i don't know but they're mm-hmm. that's a really good one for people um <clears throat> and then kind of moving on into terrestrials i definitely wanted to tie some ants we've got three or four tutorials on ants mm-hmm. bionic ants probably the most popular one right now uh hoppers We've got a lot of hopper tutorials on there, uh, and then some beetles that kind of round off the my list of what if you're going to start tying dries. But again, it depends where yeah. you are. Yep. So. Yeah, exactly. What is your if you had to say your best resource book or anything out there that's or 
even videos that's not your own stuff where would you direct somebody or what, what did you or maybe what did you learn on so uh, when it comes to dry flies uh, i think your best resource is to look at entomology so i i've got uh, the caddis book i've got uh, western mayfly hatches um and a couple of other kind of entomological books that you can learn. Because in some cases, even if you're in a, a local stream, you may think you know what the caddis is. And, and to, to a large extent, you, you know, the fish aren't going to be uber picky, but sometimes they are. So I think it's a good idea to understand why you're throwing a dry fly and what you're trying to imitate. Mm-hmm. So I, I personally think a, a huge part of that would be the entomology side and there's one maybe two websites that have good entomology resources but by and large books Mm. are going to be your better bet tying on the other hand i'm more in favor of videos you know davy mcphail tight line in the riffle um there's a lot of excellent excellent resources out there for tying online Mm -hmm. the instructional part of it but not so much the entomology so that that would be my approach yeah, that's true. And I think you mentioned Western Hatches with that Hayfleet's book. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Hayfleet. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, I can't remember. We'll have to, if you want to take a look at that, uh, episode 37 to check out what we talked about. I, I guess we didn't focus on dries exactly, but we did get into some good, uh, good topics. I think he broke down, um, some of the difference, differences between spinners and he gave some good tips on, mm-hmm. you know, on what to use there. So that was a really good episode. And, uh, cool. Yeah. Those are, you know, that's great, uh, great information. Uh, let's see here. I think we are getting close here to, to wrapping things up. I had a, uh, a couple more for you. Um, one of them just thinking about again, more on getting started. Did you have a couple, of, or a mentor or two of people that you followed to help you get to where you are? Or did you kind of do all this on your own? Um, so I, A.K. Best, I did read and kind of follow a lot of his stuff. He would be probably more along the lines of what my style was early on and um, and uh, reading about him and some of Gearex books uh, oh, yeah. and then his own. And so that uh, definitely early on, one of the ones I remember the most. Um, but, you know, today as far as tires, uh, you know, I, I think Cheech is one of the best tires I know. Hmm. Mm-hmm. I hate to say that to his face because <laughs> his head's going to get huge. <laughs> nice. um, Charlie Craven is another incredible tire. Davy McPhail. Yeah. Um, and there's a whole lot that we you know, we associate with now. It's just the, the number of, at least I think, visibility of good tires has gone right uh, through the roof with social media. Yeah. Uh, so, and that's really like today where I would draw a lot of inspiration from is just looking at these other dudes they're out there tying and mm-hmm. they're killing it I so know. good motivation <laughs> yeah the other thing i love is the uh the fact that it doesn't matter how long you've been tying we had this uh, conversation mm-hmm. on another show i think it was uh, sun tao who is more of an instagram he doesn't really i don't think do videos but he's got yeah. some beautiful flies and i think he's only been tying a couple of years and um so you know i mean i think it, it's just you know if you want to go for it i think you can become an amazing tire you just just even if you're starting right now so it's pretty cool mm-hmm. yeah for sure all right well let's see um as far as fly fishing or fly tying are you uh now are you more of a fly fisher or a fly tire you think ah uh, for me i'd say it's really still 50 50 that's kind yeah. of the balance i've tried to strike uh traditionally i tie more in the winter months um just because i'm the lawn doesn't grow and the kids don't have soccer games, yep. uh, you know, so there's a lot of other distractions in the summer vacations, that yeah. sort of thing. Um, so I, I would say I definitely fish more in the warmer months, tie more in the colder months, but overall I do find, you know, an enjoyment level for me that's, you know, if it's a chilly October day and, and it may not be the greatest fishing outing, I'll, I'll tie for eight hours, you know? Uh-huh. So I'm, it doesn't bother me to, to sit down and tie and have to miss a day of fishing or vice versa. So. Yeah. Okay. And as far as your, uh, if you had to pick one fly tying material for dry flies, that's, um, not the hackle, what, what would it be? Mm-hmm. Um, I would say a good 
floatable dubbing, like mm-hmm. a uh, beaver oh, dubbing. Uh-huh. Really good. It's, it's like uh, a, a natural. Super fine. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. So it because you you're pretty versatile. You can do thoraxes. You can do bodies. Yeah. Just a lot of different things. So yeah. Cool. Cool. That's a that's a good tip. What's uh. Do you have a place? Uh, it sounds like you fish. Um, you know, obviously you're in Utah. Do you get around uh, the country, or do you have like a bucket list of places you want to fish? Um, yeah, we get around the West pretty good. Uh, not like on a super frequent basis, but we've we've definitely fished most of the Western states. Um, there's some lakes and high mountain lakes in Colorado I'd like to try that uh, I've had my eye on. Um, you know, I've only fished Henry's Lake a couple of times. Uh, I would like to get back up there and do that. And Hebgen, uh, those are mm-hmm. close enough to us. I don't know why I don't fish them more. <laughs> um, but yeah, there's. I guess my bucket list is too long to even go into. But uh, yeah. saltwater destinations as well. I mean, we're we're <laughs> just uh, the list is long. Yeah, yeah, I know. I know the saltwater thing is. I'm just getting into chatting with people about some of the saltwater and had uh, uh, Yaku Lucas on, or recently we were chatting. And uh, man, yeah, it's pretty amazing. He was describing what it feels like to um, hook into a GT and the whole process, mm-hmm. which I've never, uh, I haven't done. And yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a different deal It's it, from, a, from a trout take, which is amazing. A trout on the dry is, is no question amazing. But yeah, it just sounds like something you got to try to get out for some of the salt. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Cool. So, okay. Um, well, that's about all I have. I just want to check as far as in the next uh, six months or so, maybe you can let us know, you know, what you have going on either with uh, mm-hmm. Fly Fish Food or personally or what we can expect from you guys. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just, uh, you know, videos or we're still, we're cranking those out. Uh, ideally in the next six months, we're in a new space. Um, like I said, we're working with, hairline on a new product introduction here in the next bit uh working with joe mathis on some matte beads from firehole sticks those will be called firehole stones um Mm -hmm. so lots of product uh, kind of uh, releases in that that are on the horizon and and we hope to we've as far as videos go we're going to do a conventional bass versus fly caught bass video Hmm. Um, that will be kind of interesting Mm -hmm. and um, we've got a couple of possible carp uh, outings planned that we'll see how we can get on the uh, get on video and so but yeah beyond that it's tying and uh, a few more trips here and there cool yeah cool and i was just just kind of got me thinking as far as you know again we're the fly fish food brand i mean if you could see this thing down the line and you know, whatever time period becoming a, a full-time thing. Is that something that you would want to go into if you guys could do that or are you more? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, you got to do it right. Uh, timing's you know, good, a good, uh, gauge there. We need to make sure it's timed right. Mm-hmm. We've got a lot of people that are interested in having us open up other locations. We do have uh, definitely a national reach. And mm-hmm. so we've had some actually pretty, pretty strong interest in opening different locations across the U S and oh, cool. certain certain spots. Not that we're headed there tomorrow. Sure. But it's always, it's always out there. So. Uh-huh. That's awesome. But yeah. Beyond that, we're just looking to keep growing and, and yeah. having fun with it. Yeah. That's yeah. great. Well, as far as, uh, um, if people want to find you or if they have questions, where would be the best place to direct them? Yeah. If you go to flyfishfood.com, we're there. Uh, most of our, videos and tutorials are kind of anchored there you can go to youtube search for fly fish food uh we have a lot of instagram presence and then on facebook we have a facebook group called fly tying with uncle cheech mm-hmm. that's got 20 some odd thousand mm-hmm. uh people that participate that's a good one it's mm-hmm. uh tying focused uh we try to cut down on the yeah the ads negative Nellies. Oh, yeah. you, you gotta, you gotta police that, but yeah. we do, uh, there's a lot of great tires on there. And, yeah. Uh, I just saw somebody, um, just on another note, just last night it was on a Facebook live and it was kind of some guy in his garage just starting to tie, right. Just filming uh-huh. himself. 
and I just kind of caught it quickly. And, you know, he had some guy that just went on there and said something like, you know, just, just heckling him, you know, sort of mm-hmm. thing. And it was just like, man, I guess there's always going to be those people out there. I mean, it's like, you just kind of, have you guys seen some of that? And then how, you know, oh, yeah. over there's, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we had a dude, whenever we did a live event, he was nonstop. Um, and I, you, you know, you sit there and go, what, what, what's the point of that? Yep. It's not, it just makes you look like a goof. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and there's, there's always, uh, going to be haters or whatever you want to oh, call yeah. them that, that, that kind of distract from what you have going on. And, yep. but just like anything, you got to kind of overlook those guys and keep your eye on the ball. And that's right. Yep. You'll, yep. You'll keep do it well. Keep it going, moving forward. Cool. Yeah. All, all right, Curtis. Well, uh, yeah, I just want to thank you for coming on the show. Um, it was a lot of fun talking about your history and a little bit on dries and all that. And I uh, just want to thank you for all the videos. You know, I, I think anybody that hasn't seen you out there, they should check out what you have going because there's a ton of ton of information. And yeah, so uh, yeah, we'll keep in touch with you and I'll, I'll check back and talk okay. to you soon. All right. Sounds good. Appreciate oh, it. All right. See ya. Bye. So there you go. If you want to find all the show notes with all the links we cover, just go to wetflyswing.com slash 40. And uh, please head over to the link there at that uh, URL and leave a comment on the blog post. Anything you have, even a short little one-liner would be awesome. Thanks again for stopping by to check out the show today. I'm looking forward to catching up with you soon and hope to see you uh, online or on the river. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com. And if you found this episode helpful, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes. 